I am Sophie. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at Northeast Wilderness Trust. Um, and we are a region-wide land trust. So we work across New England and Eastern New, New York, primarily in the Adirondacks. And we're actually the only land trust in the Northeast that focuses exclusively on the protection of wild lands and something that we call rewilding, which is a global trend taking off these this, these days. And it's a really great thing that it is. Um, and so we'll get in more into what that means and how people are enacting that both here in our own backyards and across the world. So Northeast Wilderness Trust currently safeguards more than 58,000 forever wild acres. And what's so special about these lands are that they will be the old growth forests of tomorrow since they will not be logged from the moment they're protected onwards. So in that way, they're afforded the time and space to grow old, complex, wild, and create a niche of habitat that has largely been absent from this area of the continent, which has been under near constant management and use since the arrival of European colonists. What we're looking at right here is the Burnt Mountain area in Montgomery, Vermont, in the far north of Vermont. And this area is owned by the Nature Conservancy. It's a little over 5,000 acres. And Northeast Wilderness Trust holds a conservation easement, which are legally binding protections on the land to ensure it stays wild. There we go. So to situate the current context of why rewilding is so important right now, we will take a little trip back in time. I'm sure this history of um, our region is familiar to you all, uh, but just to get us situated, um, the reason why we're here today and why rewilding is so important um, is that the Northeast has only very recently come under such intensive use and extraction. For thousands and thousands of years, this region was home to many diverse cultures of indigenous peoples and a full suite of biodiversity from apex predators like catamounts and wolves on down to the teeniest of tiniest creatures that science still has yet to describe. So this land was not empty or untouched, but rather full of life, both human and other than human. In what was essentially an ecological split second of a time, all across north, the Northeast, European settlers cleared upwards of three quarters of the forested landscape by the, between the 15-1600s through the late 1800s. And this was in a race to domesticate and own the land for agriculture, charcoal, timber, other uses. So if we take Vermont as an example, um, this state and beyond its borders called Indakina by the Abenaki who lived here when colonists arrived and continue to live here today. By the late 1800s, few forests at all existed below anywhere below 2000 feet in elevation in Vermont, very few. This is a photo taken right on the White River from a century ago what, during one of those log drives. And you can see that all those logs in the, in the bottom of the photo are floating on the river ready to go downstream and be sold. You can see the hillside on the right has been completely denuded. So um, this photograph is an important reminder that when we bring wilderness to the Northeast, we're not protecting it thinking that it's a pristine landscape that has never been touched. Uh, that's not what the wilderness context is about in this sense. Uh, so here we have a picture of the White River today. This is the longest free flowing tributary to the Connecticut River. And you can see its hillsides now are reforested, living, breathing banks. This transformation shows the promise of letting land regrow, rebuild, and even rewild. And we will get to the differences between those. So rewilding. Rewilding goes hand in hand with regrowth and recovery. It's the concept of restoring ecosystems and the life supporting functions they provide. You may be familiar with ecosystem restoration where people 
help to install plants to bring a wetland back or maybe make some uh, infrastructural changes to the ground. The difference between that and rewilding is that we're largely letting nature do the rebuilding process. So at Northeast Wilderness Trust, there may be an occasional restoration act that we do, such as removing when we conserve a property that had been logged and there's logging roads, we might remove some of that infrastructure, such as the metal culverts that had been there and restore some of the stream bank structure in a place where there was a log landing and the soil is really compacted, we might free that up a bit and sow some native seeds, plant a few saplings. But those interventions are fairly far between. We usually conserve land that of course has a history of logging as most of the Northeast does and let the forest go on its own path from there. Um, and we'll talk more about what that looks like and what uh, these lands include and don't include. Um, and rewilding is happening at all kinds of levels, um, from the local to the global. Um, and going back to that history of the Northeast, um, I like to share this quote from Bill McKibben. He says, the Adirondacks are perhaps the world's greatest experiment in ecological recovery, a place hard used a century ago and now slowly recovering, slowly proving that where humanity backs off, nature rebounds. So we see much the same thing in Vermont. After textile mills cropped up, um, farms that had supplied wool across much of Vermont were abandoned. New forms of fuel like coal lessened the need for charcoal and timber as fuel. Uh, much of B Vermont's bare land had the chance to regrow back into forests. It was a sort of accidental rewilding as a side effect of economic and cultural forces. So it is true, thankfully, that our forests have regrown to cover more than 70% of the state, which is a great success story. But note that they have not fully recovered and very few of them can be considered what we called wild. Even with the amazing reforestation that has occurred across New England, the reality is that since most of our forests are managed, they're kept between the ages of 50 and 100 years old. So that's their maturity in a timber value sense, but their maturity in an ecological sense is well past 100 years. An old growth forest has to be more than 200 years old. And before colonization, more than two thirds of the Northeast was in that old growth, late successional state, which is a dynamic, ever changing state but it means that there haven't been major disturbances for, for many decades and even centuries. Um, so when we look at the context of how much is still old growth today, it's less than 1% across New England and in Vermont. That number gets higher when you look out west, but here in the Northeast, it's pretty dismal. Uh, that number is just heartbreaking to me that the average person, let alone the wild creatures who live in these places, don't know the look, feel, or the character of what an old eastern forest is like. I would love to know that, and I would love to see that in my hometown and my backyard. And the good news is that we can change that. So we have pages that are yet to be written in, our, in these chapters of rewilding. And there are plenty of landscapes that still have the possibility to be protected as wild forests. So now is the chance to bring back missing old forests, missing predators, missing ecological balance and resilience right here. But unlike the accidental regrowth of the early 1900s, this time we'll have to make an intentional active choice in order for rewilding to win the day. So some of you may also know this, um, the trend of forest cover has been going up for a long time, uh, but in the 2010s, I think it might have been 2015 or 16, that trend for the first time since the early 1900s started to go down again. So for the first time in more than a century, we're starting to lose forest cover in Vermont again. So we had great historic acts of creating wilderness the Adirondack Park, Baxter State Park, the wilderness areas of the Green Mountain National Forest. Uh, but this momentum now needs to be followed at a different scale. That's going to include landowners, 
land trusts, nonprofits, activists, and policymakers. And that's where rewilding comes in. So simply put, rewilding means allowing nature the necessary time and space to heal and restore its life supporting functions. I would argue that it also means redefining what our relationship to nature is, saying that we humans are one of many species, all of whom belong here and all of whom deserve the opportunity to survive, thrive, and create future generations, just like we humans want to do. So Northeast Wilderness Trust is proud to be a, one of the preliminary sponsors of the Global Charter for Rewilding the Earth, which is a lovely document creating a vision for a rewilded world. Um, and this is part of the Global Rewilding Alliance. Um, and I wanna take a moment to read the vision statement because it's just emblematic of what we do and what we believe in. We believe that the world can be more beautiful, more diverse, more equitable, more wild. We believe that nature's innate resilience, bolstered by human care, can initiate an era of planetary healing. In that future time when the world is whole and healthy, undammed rivers will run to the sea, their estuaries teeming with life. Following ancient patterns, whales and warblers will migrate unmolested through the sea and sky. From tiny phytoplankton to the tallest redwoods, all Earth's creatures will be free to pursue lives of quality and humanity will thrive amidst nature's abundance. A pretty beautiful vision. So let's take a look at where we are now. So we got the history, now let's ground ourselves in the present. So the conservation context of the Northeast looks pretty good at this level. So right now what we're looking at is all conserved land in the Northeast. So that's not just wild forests, that's farms, parks, recreation areas, uh, managed woodlands that might supply timber or firewood or maple syrup. Um, so that's looking pretty good. That's about 25% a quarter of our landscape that we know won't be turned into shopping malls or sprawling development. But this is very different than forests that won't be logged. So when we peel back a layer and we look at what of those areas are actually wildlands, that shrinks a lot. So we've got some good patches in the Adirondacks and the Catskills. We've got a smattering in the White Mountains. We've got Baxter State Park standing out and a little bit connecting the spine of the Green Mountains. But largely you can see that these are very isolated, fragmented islands of wild habitat. And as we'll go over, the benefits that these areas provide far outweigh their size, but we still need a lot more of them. So of that, um, go back one slide, of this 25 percent, this quarter of the land that's conserved, 97 percent of it is, is managed. Only 3 percent of it, this amount, is wild, existing for its own sake, evolving on its own terms. So I present this map to illustrate the lack of wildlands, but not to throw woodlands under the bus. I greatly value the timber that makes up my home and I would do woodworking in my free time and I am a consumer of copious amounts of maple syrup. So I uh, very much appreciate the woodlands of Vermont um, and my wood stove keeping me warm in the winter. So sustainably managed woodlands are incredibly important. They're part of our culture and local economies. Um, but I, I make this point to show just how underrepresented wildlands are and just how much more room there is on our landscape for this kind of conservation. So we've got ourselves in the present. Let's take a quick look towards the future. Um, 
This is actually perfect. Patty mentioned at the beginning, 30 by 30 and the global deal for nature, the half earth project. So if we start at the state level, we've got our own state goals for wildlands. And these were cemented in the Vermont Conservation Design. Uh, this is a statewide initiative. It's endorsed by the Fish and Wildlife Department. And it call, among other things, it calls for 9% of Vermont forests to be protected in a way that allows them to grow old and wilder. Today, we have less than 3% protected as such. So we've got a ways to go. Many, many thousands of acres. Um, this this scene that you're looking at actually uh, marks a great step in that direction. This is the wood, uh, the the far ridge, the one that's covered in snow. <clears throat> that is part of the Woodbury Mountain Wilderness Preserve, which was just purchased in December by Northeast Wilderness Trust from the local E.B. Hyde Timber Company, the local Meyer family. Um, and that's now 5,900 acres of land that will be allowed to become old growth forest in the coming decades and centuries. And this land was protected just after the release of Vermont Climate Action Plan, which is the roadmap to meeting the state's Global Warming Solutions Act. And that plan specifically calls out that 9% goal of old forests, recognizing their incredible value for carbon storage and sequestration. We'll get more on that in a bit. So, th so there we've got our state goal. Then the next point, the wildlands and woodlands, that's a regional goal. So that aims to get at least 10% of the entire New England landscape protected as wildlands, complementing well-managed woodlands. So bringing those two vital components together in a beautiful way. Also at the regional scale, we have scientifically recognized wildlife corridors. Wildlife, of course, don't care about the geopolitical boundaries that we humans have composed. So these um, corridors often have partnerships around them that bring interstate and even international groups together. Um, you may have heard of staying connected issue, uh, sorry, <laughs> staying connected initiative, cold, hollow to Canada, those two are in Vermont. Um, there's Quabbin to Cardigan, Algonquin to Adirondacks, two countries, one forest. So people working together across state lines and even um, across international lines to make sure that our political differences don't get in the way of where wildlife have to move is incredibly important. Um, finally, on a national and global level, we've got 30 by 30 and the global deer for nature, uh, which as Patty said, emphasizes that we need to protect 30% of ecosystems for nature's sake. Uh, that can sometimes get misinterpreted, that can sometimes get skewed to 30% conserved in any kind of way, including management, but really the initial point of the paper, the global deal for nature is to protect 30% protect in a more preservation wildlands type of way that prioritizes the needs of the ecosystem itself in order to sustain its life-giving functions. Um, and then globally, there's Nature Needs Half and the Half Earth Project, which advocate for 50% of the earth to be available for nature in order for us all to live well on this planet. So those are setting goals for the future that we are hoping to meet. And wilderness is a key tool in doing that. So what is wilderness? I'll start with the etymology of the word. Will comes from will as in um, the force of our internal will. Um, and then ness is land. And so it breaks down to the will of the land, whatever the intention or natural course of action that the land itself has, rather than the will of what we people need or want being imposed upon the land in a way that changes it so um, fundamentally. So in a wild landscape, the land is on its own time and on its own terms. Trees can grow old and die. Species can give life to multiple generations and evolve naturally. 
Forest complexity increases, niche habitats are created because of a, an abundance of coarse woody debris. That's all those downed logs and fallen branches, which are largely missing from uh, the majority of our forests currently. And all of this biomass and complexity is increasing year after year. So it might seem like forever wild conservation is just about the absence of commercial forestry, but it's far more than that. It's a conviction in the power and the viability and the wisdom of nature when left to its own devices. It's the belief that some forests deserve to be free from human control and management and manipulation. It's trusting that when a section of forest gets toppled over by natural disturbances, which will happen in wild forests and are very great for diversity and bringing a mix of age classes into the forest, uh, trusting that the forest will heal on its own as it's been doing for millions and billions of years. We recognize that in the past, the forests of the Northeast looked a lot different than they do now. And in the future with the impacts of climate change that we have already set into motion and the many species moving around the world that has already been set in motion by people, these forests that we see today are also going to look very different in the future. And if we let forests evolve naturally, they'll be able to re have resilience to those changes over the long term. It's embracing the fact that forests grow old and mature and regenerate on a time scale that's much longer than our own. And when we know that there are places out there where the land is moving at forest time, not on human or business time, uh, then we can go to these places and also slow to the rhythms of Earth's pace. And it's also knowing that while we benefit so much from forests that they are our lifeblood and sustenance on this planet, they're not here solely for our benefit. They have purposes beyond we humans. And knowing this, we can enter these places in quiet reverence and in witness to the greater flow of life beyond my tiny personal dramas. These are places where we can seek deep reciprocal relations with other than human life. And finally, it's a belief that the species that call these places home have intrinsic value and deserve to exist as free from human dominion in some places beyond any benefit whatsoever to us people. So when we're speaking of New England, we know it has been cut over and has many thousands of years of human history here. And um, oftentimes there's this correlation with wilderness, uh, something that's pristine or untouched or uh, you know primeval forest. Um, and that's just simply not the whole story. Um, so that begs the question in this heavily populated, heavily used re region, uh, millions of people, millions of acres of development and very young forest roads everywhere. Can we really have wilderness here in the Northeast? We at Northeast Wilderness Trust believe that the answer is yes. And I suspect that you're probably here tonight because you might feel the same way. So this guy sitting right here is uh, Howard Sennheiser, the author of The Wilderness Act co-author of the Wilderness Act of 1964. Uh, he's sitting in the Adirondacks here, looking out over the landscape, and he consciously used the obscure word untrammeled in his writing, in the law's definition. So it's not pristine, it's not ancient, it's not locked away, it's untrammeled, which means freedom of expression or action. So these lands are places where plants, animals, and fungi are not deprived of their freedom. That is the primary characteristic of wilderness. It's a choice, not predicated on a particular state of the land or what the history was, but reliant on what we can imagine moving forward and what kind of commitment we can make to a beautiful and resilient future.
So the words directly from the Wilderness Act are that these places are areas where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man is a visitor who does not remain. So that people are there on the landscape, moving through, gaining the benefit of being in relationship to these places, but they're not permanent. There's not that permanent fundamental change. It's not, and we like to say, this was a quote from our, the paragraph underneath from a former executive director of Northeast Wilderness Trust. Wilderness is not simply a special kind of place, but rather a commitment we make to a place. The commitment is to freedom, to animals, and to the natural processes that produce integrity, beauty, and diversity of the land community. Oops, there we go. <laughs> so I'd like to share now some examples of rewilding, and I'd specifically like to show how rewilding refutes some of those common misconceptions of wilderness as needing to be a pristine or untouched place. Um, and I'll start with some examples from Northeast Wilderness Trust that uh, you might be able to visit someday, and then we'll talk about some that are beyond uh, my particular organization. So this lovely scene is Muddy Pond. Muddy Pond, um, it, so Muddy Pond is right in the heart of Southeast Massachusetts. This ecosystem you're seeing is uh, the coastal pine barrens and they're sitting on a coastal plain pond. Um, and this property is just 40 miles from Fenway Park. Uh, it has three dozen vernal pools and it's 350 acres. It also is right next to a Walmart and a housing development and a highway. So we might look at this and see this urban context and say, how can this be wilderness? But it's not about the, the um, exact things around it or the place itself. It's about the promise that we're making to that place. And that promise, when we purchased this land uh, back in 2018, I believe it was, was that these trees will never be logged. They, they will continue to serve as wildlife habit and as peaceful respite um, in this place with very, very high rapid development pressure. And Muddy Pond is also serving as a community engagement area. So um, we have school field trips visit there, slowed down with COVID, but we do public events as well, volunteer days, educational events. Um, so some great partnerships and getting people connected to the values of wildlands and to this very unique ecosystem in their own backyard, uh, which includes some rare and endangered plants um, right under their noses, but often people don't get to go see it because we're so wrapped up in our busy lives. So these are just some of the um, wildlife that can be seen on Muddy Pond. Many migratory birds stop through. Um, and as I mentioned, there's rich endemic plant life there as well. This lovely forest is another um, somewhat of an anomaly for wildlands conservation. This is Babysitter Swamp, and it is in northern Vermont, and a conservation easement was donated on this land to Northeast Wilderness Trust by landowner Sue Morse, who some of you might know. She's a renowned wildlife tracker and educator. Um, and she is a scientist and she uh, monitor, she tracks um, all kinds of species behavior. And on her land, even though it's just 30 protected acres, it, it is one of the few tracks along this large wetland complex that has large trees. And year after year, the mo mother bears come to this area and they put their bear cubs in the trees and they let the trees babysit their bears while they go forage on the fresh green wetland 
food that they've been waiting for all winter long. So that's how it got its name, Babysitter Swamp. And that shows you just one of many values of these old trees and that the bears are coming out and picking this one specific spot. So small area, large benefit. Another example is Eagle Mountain Wilderness Preserve in the Champlain Valley of the Adirondacks. And I point this preserve out for two reasons. One, it has that history of logging. Uh, Northeast Wilderness Trust purchased this from a timber company um, and they managed the land quite well. Um, so it was not, you know, clear cut or anything like that. Um, but still, it being heavily managed for timber, it doesn't have a huge amount of forest complexity, that variation in ages of the forest stands. Uh, but from the day we bought it in 2018 and moving forward, it is untrammeled it is, and thus wild. It does not have that permanent fundamental change of human uh, extraction for use. Um, and so it now has the freedom to evolve and grow old. The other reason I point this out is because this is um, in the Champlain Valley of New York. It's right in between Lake Champlain and the Adirondacks. And the Adirondacks has plenty of forever wild conservation, as you saw in that map I showed earlier. Same thing with the peaks of the White Mountains, the high elevations of the Green Mountains, way up on Mount Katahdin. So there's a lot in common there. They're really hard to get to places. They're really high. They're they're not very valuable for human extraction. So it's much easier to put those places aside for wilderness when it's harder for us to get to them and when it's more costly to take uh, resources from them. But the majority of biodiversity is found at low elevations. And low elevations are much easier to um, use and access. And so often it's can be harder to convince people or get funding to protect um, low elevation lands for biodiversity's sake. But that's where it needs to happen because that's where most of the plants and animals, et cetera, are going to be found. So Eagle Mountain sits right in between Lake Champlain, very low elevation, and the Adirondack High Peaks, very high elevation. So it's this fundamental stepping stone between these two very different ecosystems, which will be very important as climate changes and animals and plants need to adapt to those changing conditions. Uh, but it also means being in that lower elevation area, it's protecting a biome, an ecosystem that is much less represented in, the, in what few wildlands do exist. So that's another point in wildlands conservation is not only is there more room for it on the map, but since most of it is are these high peak areas, there's a lot more room and need for it in the low elevations. So we'll zoom out from Newt a bit and look at some hopeful stories from around the world. Um, I keep a Google alert for rewilding and for wilderness. Um, and so it's always really fun for me to see stories from around the world. Um, you know, we need a little good news and hope these days. So rewilding is taking off around the world. Here we've got an article from India extolling the benefits of um, a wide range of bringing back wild species, letting them proliferate. Recently, jaguars were released in Argentina and their populations are climbing. They had nearly been hunted to extinction. There are also some success stories from Argentina and Chile of the giant otter and macaws, um, largely thanks to Tompkins conservation. Um, very exciting work happening down there. We've even got entire nations who are dedicating to rewilding. 
Uh, Scotland could become the first rewilding nation. And for anyone familiar with Scotland, I've never been there, so I'm not terribly familiar, but I know if, I know that m most of its forest is gone, not just recovered like the Northeast, but gone. And that's the case in much of the UK. So to see rewilding being possible from a state of pastures and fields, that's incredible. And if you think about the carbon that can be absorbed and the biodiversity that can come back from where you're starting at that much lower place, that's a huge um, you know, potential for gain. Over in Brazil, I'm sorry, Belize, um, a wildlife corridor is being built. Another great example of partnership, um, many different organizations working together, also with a focus on those carnivores, key ecological players. Back, taking a trip back the pond, across the pond to England, um, there's been a bunch of news recently about um, the UK government offering public funding to farmers who will rewild their land, their fields. And this is, of course, very controversial of, you know, will this um, make farming extinct or hurt our economy? And there was a recent poll that found four fifths of um, Brits were in favor of this rewilding plan. So things will always be controversial, but it's heartening to see such a large majority of people in getting psyched about rewilding. Back across the pond again, down to Peru and Ecuador, indigenous leaders have a plan to protect 80% of the Amazon. Um, that might not be, you know, wild, wilderness status level protections that we're talking about, but this will, this will be, um, you know, critical as we're losing so much forest in the Amazon to meat production, to timber, to farming, um, and indigenous leaders are taking a stand. And um, some may be familiar with the statistic that 80% of the world's biodiversity rests in lands that are tribally held. Um, so indigenous leaders are critical partners and knowledge keepers when it comes to conserving biodiversity and looking towards a resilient future. So now we'll zoom in on the US um, and take a look at some unusual rewilding. Uh, it doesn't have to just be big swaths of open land. Rewilding can take place in the city. Here we have a very recent article about marshland being restored to San Diego. Um, I saw after that that there was an opinion piece that there was a uh, a more wild option that the city opted not to take. So it sounds like it's not as progressive as it could be, but um, you know, a step in the right direction. Um, more marshland within a city, benefits to human committee communities for flooding and sea level rise, bird watchers, again, having a great day. Um, and most importantly, important for the ocean and the wildlife. Here's a park in Illinois that had a rewilding uh, approach. And you can see in the sub headline, prairie restoration efforts sparked outrage. And the rest of the article talks about how the aesthetic of, you know, things don't look mode um, can grind at people's um, expectations of what a park or a lawn should look like. Um, so there's when we talk about rewilding ourselves, there's also a rewilding our culture component as well, step by step, letting people know that, you know, messy is beautiful. And, you know, there there might be some bird nests in those gra that grass that you can't see that weren't there when that place was mowed, etc. Let's go catch some butterflies together. They weren't here before when the grass was mowed. So over here in the east, we've got some very new wildlife protection in Florida, a very large wildlife corridor. Um, and this gives me hope as well. And you can see again, the emphasis on panthers, same species as catamount, same species of cougar across the US, um, that focus on carnivores, 
that focused on connected corridors, just like we were talking about up here in the Northeast with those um, cross-border initiatives. These kinds of large-scale landscape-focused rewilding efforts are what's going to make the difference for um, species moving in response to climate change, L animals with large territory being able to survive and thrive. Um, but it doesn't mean that backyard re rewilding isn't important or that addressing infrastructure isn't important. So here we've got the Elwha River, um, which had been dammed. The dam had been taken ha is taken out, and that's a big rewilding initiative. Uh, that is growing as dams become defunct and expensive to maintain, and people are realizing how much they have impacted fish populations. And this example and another example in Alaska were both native-led um, collaborations uh, to restore the rivers. And also with that, not only comes all the ecological benefits, but also the cultural benefits that come with healthy fish populations and being able to um, have restored environment and cultural practices. And now even closer to home, some focus on cleaning up rivers in Boston. This even included tearing up some pavement, getting some of that human impact out of there. And this is someone named Doug Tallamy, who um, is a big advocate for native plants and rewilding backyards and just how much of a difference uh, even a small backyard can make for birds and insects and other beings. Um, and I heard also that he has this scheme that everybody's rewilded backyard he'll enroll them together and somehow it will be the nation's biggest new national park um which is just lovely to think about and i really appreciate that kind of scale of rewilding because it doesn't just have to be big governments and big conservation organizations we can all be involved with this we can all take our friends on the walks and woods and think about what kinds of resources or connections we have access to and how those might relate to a wilder world.